Question 71. Which of the following statements is most likely true about the behavior of investors in bubbles? A. Overconfident investors lead to an increase in market volatility. This could possibly be our answer when markets or specific stocks are going up. Investors a lot of times will um, overcompensate for thinking that that's skill rather than luck or just kind of riding what the market's doing. Um, and in that case, they may get a little bit more risky with their investments or start picking more stocks in different areas. Um, and then this overconfidence and skill can kind of lead to increased volatility. So A can po probably be our answer, but let's make sure we can rule out B and C. B, rational investors expect a future crash. Sounds good. Um, and know the exact timing. We can't anticipate crashes. It's typically going to be some unknowable, unknowable exogenous event that causes a crash. Um, so just because we're rational doesn't mean we'll know the exact timing. And C, regret aversion discourages investors from participating in a bubble as they believe the value of stocks is likely to depreciate, resulting in losses. So regret aversion is actually going to encourage investors to participate in the bubble. Um, since this bias is going to make us more likely to um, be averse to missing out on opportunities, um, stocks uh, appreciating missing out on, on those opportunities. So we go ahead and cross off C and conclude that we can stick with A. Question 72. A county wants to build a state-of-the-art maximum correctional facility. The county is most likely engaging in what type of a project? A greenfield project, a brownfield project, or a construction project. Um, so this is a infrastructure project, and these are typically infrastructure assets are going to be referred to as either greenfield or brownfield. So we can go ahead and cross off construction project right away. Um, so then looking at these two answers, greenfield projects are going to be new projects building assets from scratch, and brownfield uh, projects are going to be investing into old infrastructure assets. Um, so it says right here, we are building a state-of-the-art maximum correction facility. Um, so this is going to be a from scratch project. So we can go ahead and go with a greenfield project. Question 73, which of the following is least likely a characteristic that makes a firm attractive for a leveraged buyout? So two of these are going to be um, attractive for leveraged buyouts and then one will not be. So we've got a high leverage. This uh, could be our answer. We want to, we're using leverage in the leveraged buyout, um, but we don't want to buy a firm that already has high leverage. We want a firm that um, probably has low leverage because if they already have high leverage and we're using more leverage to buy it out, it's going to be difficult for those cash flows to service that new debt. Um, so A is probably going to be our answer, but let's make sure we can rule out B and C. B, poor management. This is a characteristic that makes a firm attractive. Um, Private equity firms can come in and replace management um, and improve operations, and this is how they can really add value to the business to then later sell it at a more premium price. And C, strong and consistent cash flows. Yes, this is also a characteristic. Um, like we said, this is leveraged buyout. We're using debt to do it. We want a firm that has strong and consistent cash flows to service that debt. So we will stick with A, high leverage. Question 74. Consider an April USD 190 put on the stock of Facebook. So just to be clear, this 190 is going to be the strike price, and um, we're looking at a put option on Facebook. If FB is currently worth USD 175, so we've got our current price here and strike price here, which of the following statements is most likely correct? The option is currently in the money. The option is currently out of the money. The option is currently at the money. We can go ahead and cross off at the money right away. We're going to be at the money if our strike price is close to what we're at right now. We're uh, pretty far off here, $15 or just under 10% off. So that wouldn't be considered at the money. Um, so then now what we need to consider is whether we're in the money or out of the money. So the put is, has a strike of 190 and we're currently at 175. Since this is a put option, we're going to be in the money. And we know that we're in the money because if we exercise a put, we're going to be able to buy, uh, sell the stock at 190. When we're buying a put, we have the right but not the obligation to sell the stock at the strike price. 
So if we're going to exercise this put, we'll be able to sell at 190, buy it at the current price of 175, and we would make some money. So that being said, we'll be in the money. If this were a call option and the strike was 190 and we're currently at 175, then we'd be out of the money. Um, but uh, for puts, we need the strike price to be above the market price to be in the money. For calls, we need the strike price to be below um, the market price to be in the money. So we've got answer A. Question 75. Alpha C fund enters into an equity swap with an investment bank. Alpha C agrees to pay the return on the emerging market index and receive the return on the North American index. The swap's notional principal is 100 million. So this is what we're going to be basing our returns off of for the paying and receiving amount, that principal amount of 100 million. And we've got our start and end amounts here for those two indices. The net amount Alpha C has to receive pay after three months is closest to. So we are uh, paying return on emerging market index. So we're going to be paying, um, we're going to be calculating the return on this index here, which it looks like it'll be positive since it went up during that three month period. Um, we're going to be paying that amount and then we're receiving return on the North American index amount, which is looks like it went down. Um, so it looks like we're going to be paying a fair amount of money, uh, but we'll uh, do the calculations and then see what we get to. So starting, let's pull in our numbers here. So if basically, this is just going to be a basic uh, return calculation here, and then you're going to multiply it by this um, principal amount to get what we actually pay. So we've got our ending amount over beginning, minus 1 to get that return, multiply it by 100 million. And so we're going to be paying 14.6 million. Um, on that EM index and then for the North American index this is what we're supposed to be receiving so since we have a negative return um, multiply that by a hundred million we're receiving negative 4.53 million so essentially this negative turns this into um, an amount that we're now paying so what we're going to do is just add these two numbers up and then we're going to get the total amount that we're paying. So we're going to be paying that 14.68 million and plus the 4.53 million gives us 19.21. So we will go with answer C. Question 76. Graco Fund of Funds invests 50 million each in the hedge funds Lexor and Polygon. So we've got $100 million total that we're investing, 50 million in each. The fund to fund quotes a two and 20 fee structure. The management fees are calculated based on asset values at year end, while incentive fees are calculated independently of management fees. At year end, the value of the investment in Lexor and Polygon was 45 million and 62 million respectively. The investor's net of fees return is closest to. So what we're gonna do here um, to calculate that return, we're gonna be taking the value of these two of our two investments so we'll do 45 million plus 62 million that's going to be 107 um, and then we're going to need to subtract out any fees that we're paying and then um, use the beginning value of 100 um, that we have invested to calculate that net of fees return so um, let's uh, start looking at these so let's get our management fees in here so this is going to be the uh, first fee that we're paying. So management fees are 2% and we're calculating it based on asset values at year end. So we do the 45 million plus 62 million to get that year end value. Our management fees end up at 2.14 million. Uh, incentive fees, the key here is that they are paid, calculated independently of management fees. So we're not subtract, sometimes if it's uh, net of management fees, then you would subtract the 2.414 million from this number to start. But since we're not doing that, we just calculate the incentive fees on the full amount that we earned that year. So it's gonna be 7 million, the 100, 107 minus 100. Uh, and then we're multiplying that by the 20% um, incentive fee. So that brings us to 1.4 million incentive fees. So we're gonna have the, we've got 1.4 million plus 2.14 million as our total fees. From here, we can go ahead and calculate that net of fee return. We've got our 107 ending value, which is those two added up. Subtract out the management fee, subtract out the incentive fee. 
divide it by 100, subtract 1, and we see we get 0 0.0346 or 3.46%. Answer A. Question 77. Which of the following statements best describes the difference between permissioned and permissionless networks? So we've got both permissioned and permissionless networks restrict who can participate in the network. Permissionless networks are open to all participants, while permissioned networks restrict who can participate in the network. And permission networks are open to all participants, while permissionless networks restrict who can participate in the network. So basically we're looking at um, permissioned and permissionless networks, and then all these answers are based on who can participate in each network based on those. So for permissioned um, networks, these are going to be centralized, so it's run by some central third party, and so that central third party is going to be able to um, restrict who can or can't use the network. So looking at that, we've got uh, permission networks can restrict here and permissioned can also restrict here. So we can leave A and B in play. For answer C, it has permissioned is open to all participants. We can go ahead and cross C off. So then looking at permissionless, permissionless networks are going to be decentralized. So um, they will not be restricted. And so we can go ahead and cross off A here since this one has permissionless as uh, being able to restrict, but we won't be able to since they're decentralized. So we can confidently go with B, permissionless are open to all and permission can restrict. Question 78, an investor would least likely invest in commodities to A, hedge against unexpected inflation. This is a reason to invest, invest in commodities. A lot of times commodities are actually the reason for inflation happening or causing the inflation. If copper prices are skyrocketing, then this is going to be uh, flow through to supply chains and can increase the price of a lot of other goods. And that's just one example. There's a lot of different commodities that can that could apply to. Uh, B, increase portfolios returns. Um, adding commodities won't necessarily increase returns. They typically don't outpace um, equities over the long run. So incre adding them to the portfolio isn't necessarily going to increase returns. Um, oh, sorry. So since it won't increase returns, this is probably going to be our answer. Uh, but let's make sure we can rule out C as a good reason to invest in commodities. So C, diversify his portfolio. Yes, commodities uh, can be uncorrelated to more traditional assets like stocks and bonds, so they will diversify. Um, so this is a good reason to invest in commodities. Increasing portfolio returns is not, so we will go with B. Question 76. The following table presents information about XYZ hedge fund. So it looks like we've got the assets at the beginning and end, management fee, incentive fee, and the soft hurdle rate. Assuming the incentive fee is calculated independently of the management fee, and the management fee is calculated based on the value at the end of the year, an investor's net of fees return is most likely. So we're going to need to calculate two different types of fees here, and then for the net of fees return, what we're going to do is take this 120, subtract out the management fee and the incentive fee, and then um, use that beginning value of 100 to calculate our final answer. So on the management fee, we've got 2%, and it says it's calculated based on the value at the end of the year. So that's going to be a pretty simple calculation here. I'll pull in the management and incentive fee. So it's just going to be this 120 times the 0 .2, 0 0.02 fee gives us 2.4 million. The incentive fee is calculated independent of the management fee. Um, so we're going to be doing it on all the profits at the uh, end of the year. So it's going to be that 120 minus the 100 times 0.1 gives us 2 million. So this is going to be what our incentive fee is, assuming we hit that soft hurdle rate. Um, so another check we would just need to do is making sure that we had a return above the 15% hurdle rate. If we didn't hit above 15%, then we wouldn't use this in our calculation. But um, 120 over 100 is going to be a 20% return. So we, can know, we know that we beat that hurdle rate and will include the incentive fee. So from here, let's pull in that final answer. We're going to have our um, return being that ending value of 120, subtract out our two fee, the fees that we got up here, so 2.4 and 2, 
divide by 100 and subtract 1 to get that return, and we see that gives us 0 .0, or 0.156 or 15.6%. Answer B. Question 80. The expected return of the Karachi Stock Exchange is 17%, and the rate on Pakistan's risk-free rate, uh, risk-free bonds is 7.5%. Suppose the beta of Bata Corporation shares is 0.75, then the required rate of return on Bata Corporation shares is closest to. So uh, this is going to be our uh, cap M formula, and we're given all the inputs here. So we've got the risk-free rate, which will be that 7.5%, and then we're going to add that to our beta times that market uh, market risk premium. So we've got a beta of 0.75 and then market return of 17%, subtract out the risk-free rate of 7.5%. Uh, 7 and we're given all those numbers, like I mentioned, so it's really just going to be plugging those in, and uh, we'll get our answer. So we see we've got that 7.5% plus the 0.75 times 17 minus 7.5 gives us 14.63. Answer A.